then I can welcome you all to our, I have to count, one, two, three, four, fifth uh, lecture series evening in the uh, lecture series on EU energy policy on the road to decarbonization that's organized by the Institute for European Studies at the Freie Universität Brüssel in cooperation with Climate Strategies, WWF, and the Ecologic Institute in Berlin. And we gratefully acknowledge always the support by the Germany Lifelong Learning Program. Uh, today's lecture evening will address transport and industry, two big sectors, obviously, that are very relevant for the decarbonization agenda. Um, we somehow had to put them in one lecture evening. I'm sure they would deserve their own lecture evenings, each of them. But that's uh, how, how we end up, and I hope we can have a fruitful discussion and uh, a dense discussion, I assume, because it's, as I said, two big sectors. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the three speakers of the evening. The first one will be Hans Bergmann. He is a head of unit at uh, DG Climate Action. And the head of unit, we just were talking about that, that's called benchmarking, but which is basically about the emissions trading system and industry. So his presentation, I assume, will focus more on the, on the industry sector. Um, and then afterwards, what did we now say, what the order would be? First, um, Tom van Leer of the Freie Universität Brüssel, um, the research group Mobility, Logistics and Automotive Technology. Is that right? I hope. Uh, almost. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Then you will uh, correct me later on, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Last but not least, uh, Jos Dings of uh, Transport and Environment, um, who will add an NGO perspective on the transport sector. Um, with that, without further ado, can I give the floor to Hans Bergmann? Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about this topic, which is uh, certainly important and uh, not so um, easy, because the industry is, of course, many different things. and. Um, so one has to focus a little bit. I will, I will concentrate on um, the energy intensive industries, which are the industries which are covered by the EU's emissions trading scheme, which are in a way responsible for quite a large share of the EU's uh, carbon emissions. Yeah, it's better. Okay. And um, I perhaps apologize because we are extremely busy now because uh, emissions trading scheme DTS will enter a new phase uh, as from 1st January next year so it's a lot of work for us to put everything in place so I have done this presentation in a bit of a rush but I hope it will be at least serve as an uh, introduction to the topic and the perfect instance. So I will um, say a bit what I will talk about it's the, um, a bit what we have agreed within the EU when it comes to uh, decarbonization, so to speak, carbon reductions until 2020, but also what are the say, political aims for until 2050, and a bit how it, how it has gone so far with the reductions, how, to, uh, how it's possible to reach these quite ambitious goals that we have, both sort of push, push measures and pull measures, if one can call it like that. It's a little bit about industry actions themselves and conclusions. So, the first thing, you probably know this quite well by now, but um, you know we have this uh, goal of minus 20% uh, CO2 emissions by 2020, or 1990, and uh, the conditional uh, step up to minus 30% if other countries are going ahead. When it comes to industry, we have the EU ETS, which is the key instrument for the heavy industry. You probably know that ETS covers electricity production plus the heavy industry. So, and that it total is about half of the uh, EU emissions, and industry is about half of that. So I think it's about the quarter of EU emissions which are covered by comes from industry covered by the UTS. Now this is of course minus 20 percent is maybe not so super difficult to reach, but uh, by 2050 you probably also know that the EU last year made a um, so-called 2050 roadmap where uh, the there was a um, showed what was, would be needed to reach the two degree goals for the EU and the rest of the world and what, how, what EU uh, would need to reduce its emission by between 80 and 95 percent 
by 2050. And uh, this roadmap is, uh, was, uh, has been supported by 26 of the member states and also by the European Parliament. So it's not fixed policy, but it's quite clear uh, objective of the EU to, to work in this direction. And, uh, Is it uh, right? No, I want to be okay. to be no, I want to be on that one very but in my con. Shall I try? Uh, oh. Oops. Yeah, but it's apparently a heavy one. <laughs> no, it's that's why. Okay. Yes. Okay. So have you seen this before? This graph? Yeah, but you can explain. Yeah. <laughs> so at least to explain that this is the, how how it has been estim estimated that one could uh, first of all the red line is how the current basically business as usual policy would be for the EU. Which is a uh, reduction of about 40 percent <laughs> compared to 1990 to 2050, and uh, the goal to reach a minus 80 percent. How that would see and uh, behind this. Figures are different uh, calculations how one could reach it with uh, currently avail available technologies, which include CCS. And um, if you look at this, you can see that the aim is to have the power sector more or less become carbon free, and also the residential sector more or less carbon free. The industry is also reducing a lot, and that's what we focus on now. That you can see that. Uh, it's uh, perhaps not as big a uh, drastic reduction as for the power sector, but nevertheless very big uh, reduction for steam. And uh, the challenge is of course how to reach this with having uh, still having the industry there. It's of course easy if you close down the industry, but that's not the aim. So um, also how we have, what is, how the picture looks like now. The green uh, apple part is how the EG GDP has developed since 1990, and uh, uh, the blue curve below is the primary energy use. It, it shows that it uh, has been a very clear deconnection between GDP and energy use, and that shows, of course, hopefully a sign that can continue, that one can work in that direction. So. Um, Basically, to uh, clarify exactly what what I mean when I talk about energy-intensive industries, it is uh, steel, non-ferrous metals, which is aluminium, uh, copper, zinc, things like that. Uh, Electro-intensive industries, chemical industry, the oil refinery industry, um, the ceramic industry, the whole uh, area of cement, lime, and gypsum industries, and pulp and paper. So those are the main sectors covered by the yes. <coughs> so uh, so how to reach these goals now? The goals we have and the long-term goals. One measure is then somehow to push industry in that direction because of course industry knows best how to reach these goals. So as I said, ETS is the main uh, instrument. And it has a long-term trajectory to reduce the emissions. As I said, at the current pace, it will only reach this uh, minus 40% goal. But if we would have this more ambitious goal of 80%, ETS would need to be a bit uh, be made more um, ambitious with a faster annual reduction. And uh, then, by as you know, maybe how the cap and trade system works. If emissions don't reduce as fast as the cap reduces, there will be a more demand for allowances, the carbon price will go up and there will be a, st a stronger incentive to reduce the emissions. So, um, somehow it will solve itself automatically, that is the way it is. But uh, of course the aim is, as I said, to, uh, to reduce carbon intensity of industry but not necessarily reduce the production. However, we can come back a bit to that. One can question, should we produce as much of the most energy intensive Goods as we do today, can we find new uh, products to replace them with, or um, can we simply um, change some of these products? For industry, of, of course, all these sectors are very capital intensive, at least most of them, in principle. So, uh, if um, 
Some investment can, of course, be not very expensive, but many investments in the sector are uh, very costly and are expected to last 10, 20, 30 years. So it's very important for industry that they have long-term uh, as much certainty as you can have in, uh, in the current world. There's, of course, always a lot of uncertainties and the fact of climate change is also something that creates some uncertainty for industry. We know that, but it's also a policy area which didn't exist 10, 15 years ago and has risen as a huge global problem. So I think industry to some extent have to accept that to develop these policies and get them in place and will has led and will lead to some uh, uncertainty. But it's not only in the EU, it's everywhere in the world, basically. If you invest today, invest in Europe you know relatively well what kind of systems we have in other countries you don't know but it's very likely that there will be climate policies in most countries you know now China is working on it Korea and uh, many Latin American countries etc so it is something that industry if one for industries that are in this very energy intensive and CO2 intensive um, production they have to I think live with the fact that climate policy will be an important strategic factor. So we have, we can see that um, in industry already today, all the European industry is relatively efficient. There's still a lot of uh, potential that exists already today. And um, Many studies have shown both for the global sector as a whole, but also for individual sectors that there are investments that can be done that are not always very expensive and uh, can give also, at least when it comes to energy saving, uh, cost savings on the, on, on the other hand. And, um, but of course when it comes to new technology, it's very relevant uh, questions are, for example, does the technology exist already? Can it be implemented? Then it's a matter of is it available or is it patented? Uh, very important questions are if the investments costs are high or low and then if the operating costs are high or low or even negative and by negative invest operating cost I mean cost savings so that can happen of course quite often one uh, type of um, technology which for some which have very well both high investment cost and high operating cost are CCS so that's of course more challenging right if you have low cost, maybe high operating cost. And for the operating costs, of course, the carbon price would have a very direct effect, impact if the measure would be operated or not, like the CCS. While, of course, also for investment costs, but that's more for the investment itself. For this, uh, to go back to this 2050, uh, um, work that the Commission did last year. There was also done modeling to see what industry should do to reach their goals and uh, the three main um, areas would be increased energy efficiency, so there's still uh, a lot to do there. Of course it's not always cheap, but uh, the counterpart is of course that you have a, then a positive effect after on costs. More use of uh, electricity in the electric in the industrial production, and then of course it is then assumed that electricity is produced in a low carbon way. And uh, sometime in the medium future, a large scale use of CCS carbon capture and storage, also for industrial uh, emissions and the process emissions, because for industry maybe you know you have two types of CO two emissions. You have the fossil fuel that is being burned for to get energy and then you have in some industries there is the process emissions as uh, we call it. So basically when you produce steel for example you have uh, uh, it's part of the process that CO2 is uh, released in the same way you produce cement and that you cannot get rid of by being energy efficient. You have to, the only way to get rid of that is to have success. We have done in the Commission already more, more and more work is being done on uh, looking at different sectors and the energy saving potential. So this is uh, some work which is not yet finalized, but this shows, for example, that for steel there, is, there, are, there are a number of 
measures that can be taken already with uh, existing knowledge and uh, then uh, in this study which soon will be public there's also calculated cost investment cost and operating costs and and uh, whether this is already profitable with the current carbon prices or which carbon price will be needed to to uh, make these investments uh, profitable mm -hmm. so to come to the other side the one so the one thing is the ETS and the cost to reduce uh, to uh, emit CO2 which creates this incentive the other way is then we to reach this very ambitious goal there is for sure a need for more research innovation and uh, support for deployment and uh, the clearly action is needed at all levels both at the EU level and member state level and also globally probably so some um, <coughs> examples Let's see if I have that. well maybe just to mention perhaps you know this but in the industry uh, in technological development there are these nine stages of development from basic research stage one and two down to full uh, implementation in the full scale uh, applications and uh, what we often see is that there is quite a lot of work being done in research institutes etc on this first level basic research sort of laboratory work and etc but <coughs> once you come to testing things in real life to uh, <coughs> And say demonstration plants and even more on full scale plants there is often uh, it stops this kind of death value they call it and there is I think increased realization that there is a need for more public funds to support such um, such such deployment because the industry to be the first one to try something new on full scale is very risky so for the steel, for example, there is a big, uh, very big European project called Ulcos, ultra low CO2 emitting steel production or something like that, which is uh, being um, financed between the Commission, some member states and industry, and that will involve building a full-scale steel plant with a new technology that emits much less CO2 than the others. And once that will exist, it will be much easier to convince others to go the same way. Then, uh, yeah, we, of course, for technology, one should also think a bit further. We tend to think about how to produce cement a bit more efficiently or steel a bit more efficiently. But, um, you know, one can also think of a completely new way to produce something, and that some are working on that. There are those who are producing cement with almost no uh, carbon emissions today already. And uh, in different sectors, you can do it. In chemical sector, they're working more now with bio-based uh, feedstock instead of uh, mineral oils, and, uh, and there are also these new paradigms. I don't know much about it, but I read you can instead of producing chemicals in this huge complex, you can have very small um, production places, which are only a few would fit in this room. And I don't know. There are things that could happen but maybe it's not for tomorrow and then of course we can also perhaps use uh, new materials or use less of these very energy intensive materials for example the cement is now used very much for building uh, structures one could uh, use wood for example at least in Sweden where I come from there are now more several bridges made of wood instead of uh, cement and they're building now apartment blocks also with wood and all that so things can possibly change but one should also mention that many of these energy intensive material also contribute to reducing energy for example flat glass is a typical example if you have more strict energy um, requirements for buildings there will be more demand to replace windows and mineral wool is also an imaginary that's also an energy intensive product which of course creates much less emissions during its lifetime in use than what it costed to produce it. So there is in the EU we have these research funds and all that, don't go too much into it, but uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion now with the new budget, how much should be focused on this, this but clearly climate related 
research and development projects will have a high priority in the future. We also have a project linked to the ETS where we have 300 million allowances that have been sold and uh, this about 3 billion euros being also used for projects within industry. Then maybe lastly to say that when uh, this 2050 roadmap first came, a lot of industry were very skeptical and reacted quite negatively. But then, after a while, they started to think that uh, they should see what will this imply for their industry. And uh, I think the paper industry was the first to take this little bit more proactive attitude. And, and uh, now almost all of them have followed. So there are these working projects. Um, say, in each of these sector associations, European, and they have, are now working relatively ambitiously to see what, um, how their own sector could reach these 2050 goals and uh, what would be possible with current technologies, what technologies are kind of in the pipeline, maybe what I explained in this level 5 or 6 or something like that, which new technology would be needed and um, what would be needed to make this come through? Do, do they need more research, support for um, investments, etc.? And uh, of course, they also talk about the costs and is this realistic, the international competitiveness, and etc. So uh, I just had a couple of uh, examples here. But uh, here is the uh, paper industry. They have done one uh, on the aluminium industry, but many others are working on it right now. And many have said that they are quite. It has created a lot of positive uh, in thinking within industry, and people try to make it see what is possible and not only what is uh, impossible. And then, maybe as, as anyway, always mention the international aspects because we have to be aware that our European industry is under competition from the rest of the world, and uh, we have to all the time balance what kind of cost to put an industry compared to industry in the rest of the world and therefore of course the work on getting an international climate agreement is very high highest priority still and uh, that's a lot of work on that but we can also note that a lot of as i mentioned a lot of countries in the world are now introducing hopefully climate policies which also will have an impact on their industries and then it will be important for our industry to be ahead and there's of course also, now I talk mainly about uh, emitters, but we have also the very big industrial sectors that produce technology to reduce emissions. And they are of course very much in favor of ambitious climate policy because that gives them clients and they can develop new technology which they can send to the rest of the world. That is basically my, my presentation. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a challenge. Many opportunities exist, but um, we have the economic incentives, but also we need the support for research development. We have a need for long-term policies. In a way, we have it already in the EU DTS, by DTS, which is already decided for 2020 and beyond, but probably needs to be a bit more ambitious. And as I mentioned, the industry is working on their own in this also. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hans for that uh, presentation on, on the industry sector. I'm sure there can be lots of questions, uh, but we'll save those for after the other two presentations, because otherwise we may not have enough time. And thanks especially also for sticking to the time. Uh, I did, because, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thanks very much. So if we all can do that, then we'll have enough time for discussion at the end. Um, we move towards the, well, yes. I can give you a sign after 15 right. minutes if you want. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank IES for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present. In fact, I'm replacing my supervisor, Professor Makaris, uh, who supervises my PhD work. And uh, we are part of the MOBI research group, which uh, focuses on three main themes, sustainable logistics, electric and hybrid vehicles, and sustainable mobility. And for those different uh, teams, we develop tools to do analysis, like, for example, developing an external cost calculator, which is more part of my research. Um, in the context of this presentation, I will try to give you an overview of uh, what we think about the challenges for sustainable transport and give some ways where you can improve that sustainability. But 
as already mentioned, 20 minutes is a very short time, so it will be not exhaustive, but more like examples of ways to improve the sustainability of transport. Um, and just to start, um, we all know that transport is a necessary condition for economic and also social activity, freight <laughs> transport, passenger transport, but it also causes a lot of nuisances. And if you look at uh, it from a perspective of decarbonization, we are looking at the fact of the emissions of greenhouse gases, but of course you have lots of other emissions, air polluting emissions, that are also very important from a transport perspective. We have also other uh, uh, externalities like uh, odor, noise emissions. You have also another category of congestion related costs. You can also have in cities uh, particular externalities like land use and separation effects. And you also have an important transport related aspect of uh, accident costs, of uh, insecurities. So it's very important to realize that sometimes you can impose measures that lower your carbon dioxide emissions but have negative aspects on other externalities so it's not always if you focus only on the decarbonization you might do other things that are not so good from a sustainability point of view um, sustainability and transport has only emerged in the last decades before you only looked at the economic dimension and transport was measured in terms of its contribution to growth and the efficiency uh, ways that it could help to uh, to keep people employed and get them to their jobs from a competitivity point of view. But in the last two decades mostly, there was also more focus on two other dimensions that made the picture much more complicated, the societal point of view and an environmental dimension. So transport was also measured in terms of its safety, health aspects, accessibility, equity aspects, and on the environmental part, on climate change, air quality, those other externalities like noise, land use, biodiversity and waste. Um, just shortly, some slides to give you an idea. This is one from 2000 already, but just to give you an idea about the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, contribution of transport was estimated to be 13.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the figures in 2010, it was already 14.5, so an increase with 1% on such a scale, it's a huge amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And also because other sectors were able to reduce their emissions for transport, it was much more difficult and you see still an increase. So there's a problem um, to get transport under control. Um, but what was also important, I think, uh, to keep in the back of your mind, is if you look at the contribution of the different aspects of transport, you see here that in the developed countries, uh, freight transport is less important than passenger transport. And in my presentation, I will focus a lot on sustainable logistics, on freight transport, but it's important to keep in mind that if you do only work on that aspect, you lose a lot of potential to reduce carbon emissions because most of it is contributed by passenger transport. So that's an important aspect. Now, if you want to make it more sustainable, why is it not happening or not happening enough? I think this one is rather good in explaining why it's so difficult. Here you see three different categories of investments if you want to invest in more sustainable transport. It can be from a private point of view or from a company point of view. If you look at the first category, those are investments or projects where the economic return is bigger or uh, goes beyond the break-even point of the investment. So for a company, if you have an investment like this, it makes economic sense to do the investment. So those are mostly realized projects. But if you look in reality, there are lots of cases where there are such potential investments that are not being done because companies are often not aware of some of the options or alternatives that exist. See that often in a shift to intermodal transport, for example, that some companies or a lot of companies are not even aware that those options might be economically feasible for them. So even all of those potentially realizable projects are not being realized. Then you have a lot of projects or concepts or, uh, or investments where the economic return does not reach the break-even point of the investment if you only look at the economic return. If you also take into account the social return, if you would take into account all those externalities and the things that you can save on that level, 
those investments become, from a societal point of view, interesting to do. But companies or individuals are not going to do this unless there is some incentive, be it maybe a subsidy or something else, another mechanism, to make those investments feasible and to realize them. But then you get an old discussion of who should invest which part and how should you do it. And sometimes it's concepts that are not well known and you need pilot projects or even legislation that has to be changed in order to get those investments realized. And then you have another category where if you look at the economic and the social return together, those are not reaching the break-even point of the investment. But here you can ask the question, can you measure that social return adequately? So it's often not easy to calculate what is involved. Yeah, because if you only look at carbon dioxide emissions, and you only take that into account, it could be that you do not reach that uh, optimal or that break-even point. But if you go and look at the other externalities and you take those also into account, it might be that such an investment becomes feasible and should, from a societal point of view, be implemented. Um, and which way can you follow to make that sustainability in transport on a higher level? Well, we looked at four A's and I will discuss them briefly uh, one after the other. Awareness, act and shift, avoidance and anticipation. It's just like grouping the different initiatives in different categories. And the first one, probably one of the most important ones, is creating awareness. If you're not aware of the fact that all those externalities are costing the society money, sooner or later we will have to pay for it in health costs, in other costs, in climate change costs. If you do not create that awareness, people will not change their behavior. And as we have seen, Barack Obama had uh, noticed the last four years it's easier to talk about change than to actually implement it. So it almost costs you re-election. But here also you have to be aware of which are the costs that are involved. So a way to do it is to go and calculate those external costs and see for particular investments what is the impact. So we did, for example, it's just an example, a calculation for the inland port of Brussels to see what would happen if that inland port would not exist. How many trucks, in addition, would have to be going into the center of Brussels and outside the center of Brussels, or would have to cross the ring, because there's also a lot of transit traffic, uh, if that port would not exist. And we calculate that it's about 2,000 trucks extra on a daily basis that would be on the roads in the Brussels capital region. And why is that important? Because the port is also under pressure uh, from real estate developers who want no industry there, no transshipment activities, but they want to build, for example, penthouses and lofts there. So it can be interesting to make that calculation just to make society aware of the benefit that that inland port has on a transport level. A second point, very important, is avoidance. That's, of course, the best solution, just avoid transport. And so if you look at it at a higher level, it's uh, saying, for example, put your production plants closer to your markets. Then you can avoid a lot of traffic or a lot of transport. Move people closer to their work so that they don't have to do all the traveling. So that's on a higher level. But you can also look at all the traffic that's being done with empty trucks, for example. There's a lot of traffic on the roads with trucks that are not optimally loaded. And if you look at this picture, you see the blue line. Of course, if you drive with an empty truck, it already has a rather high energy consumption. And the more you load into the truck, of course, that energy consumption in absolute figures will rise. But if you look at it in relative figures expressed in grams, not per vehicle kilometer, but per ton kilometer, you see an incredible in decrease. Of course, most, mostly in the beginning, if you have no loads, your emission per ton kilometer is infinite if you carry zero tonnages. So if you look, for example, in a more refined calculation on the level of the loads in tons and the amount of empty truck kilometers. If you look at this, you see for a, a large truck, 40 to 44 ton truck, if it carries 10 tons of loads and travels 40% of empty truck kilometers, which is not so extreme, then he has a uh, carbon emission factor of 134.2 gram CO2 per ton kilometer, if that truck would drive fully loaded and avoid any empty kilometers, that would be a factor 3.4 or less. 
So you can gain incredible amounts of carbon emission reduction by bundling those. Why is it then not more done often? Well, it has to do with this kind of picture. This is a model to show you the different kinds of companies collaborating to bundle load. You have first of all an internal collaboration within a company. That's rather easy to achieve. You only have to work with people inside the company, but even then you experience barriers. If you work with vertically in your supply chain and you work with suppliers or clients, and it's also, you see that lots of times it's possible to make improvements. But the big potential is, of course, in a horizontal collaboration with, for example, other organizations or even with competitors. And you can already see in the color codes, green is easy, yellow is a little bit less easy and red is very difficult. You see that working together with competitors, of course, for obvious reasons, is often very complicated. So there's a lot of literature around all the barriers that are involved in getting companies to work together. There are some successes. For example, this picture shows you something uh, that has been done in Belgium between two major retailers who bundle their freight in one frozen goods distribution center and distribute the goods together in one round, one milk round, instead of all the different companies doing their own transport. But because it's so sensitive, we're not even allowed to show you the name of those retailers. <laughs> they just don't want to know that the people know that they would work together because it's for their image and stuff, it's very sensitive. So it's a difficult thing. This is another example from the Netherlands and it's uh, 12 transporters working together to try to bundle loads from different clients. So there are initiatives and there are organizations coming on the market trying to uh, develop such freight bundling. This is another example of avoidance. This is a pilot project in Brussels that's being carried out at the moment. It's from TNT. They used to go in and out of Brussels on an average base, daily base, 5.5 times per day with that van into Brussels driving around delivering their packages. Now they work with a mobile depot. So they only drive once into the center of Brussels with a larger truck, but then they distribute it with electric bikes. Of course, it depends on the size of the packages and some of the goods. You cannot all do that with those bikes. But a large portion of their uh, distribution now in the city center is being done in a much more carbon-friendly way. Then the third category is acting. And in acting, we mean shifting to other modes or to other hours. Shifting to other hours has no, not such much impact on carbon, but shifting to other modes, of course. There's a lot of potential. And if you look at, uh, for example, barge transport, you see more and more initiatives in city barge distribution, which is a very old concept, bringing your goods to the cities by barge. It's being picked up again. Uh, already mentioned the example of the port of Brussels. But what is important here is that to achieve such a shift to another mode, transport mode, be it rail or barge, you need to be cost effective. Otherwise, companies will never shift from one mode to the other. So what is important is to understand the intermodal cost structure. If you put goods on a truck, this is from the starting from the seaport, for example, Port of Antwerp. If you put it on a truck, the truck just leaves and it goes from point A to point B and that's it. Very easy, very fast, and there's no congestion. If you want to put it on an intermodal trajectory, first of all, your transshipment costs in the port will be higher. But then during the main voyage, your variable cost will be lower. So if the distance is long enough, you can get under the cost curve of road transport, but then you have to take into account that at the end, you still have another transshipment, and you have to do a post haulage because normally the end destination will never be just on the terminal. can be, but it's rather rare. Mostly you have to still do some trucking to get it to the end destination. Of course, this is only one aspect of your choice to choose a particular mode because there are also other aspects like security, reliability, have different other mode of choice variables. So it's not always that easy, but even on a cost perspective, and that's what I meant with awareness, here we have a map of Belgium with an indication of the different intermodal terminals and the colored parts are the market areas of particular terminals. 
So those are areas where it is cheaper with market prices to use intermodal instead of trucking. So it's a huge market potential and still a lot of it is not being used because there are other aspects for those companies. Like I said, also the frequency of the shipments and stuff like that. So you have lots of barriers to overcome in order for companies to shift their containers from trucking to intermodal. All right. This to help the people or the companies in order to shift to intermodal, we developed a website, but it's, it was only funded by the province of Flemish Brabant. So it's only available for companies located in Flemish Brabant with a website where they can put their uh, company naming and you get the closest terminal with contact figures and also a calculation of the cost and the carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. The difference between going by truck or going by rail or uh, barge. Also interesting is to see that usually barge was only used for bulk and containers and you now see initiatives where they do pallet transport. Also sometimes very difficult because of security things and there are not so many systems already in use so they are trying, it's like experimenting sometimes to do it in a more efficient way because you want to reduce the transshipment costs. Okay, these are other uh, examples of city barge transport already with electric boats for example which has also an extra impact on your carbon dioxide. But it's not limited to barge, you also have initiatives with trams, like a cargo tram in Dresden. Why is it interesting? Well, just if you look at these figures, this gives the average CO2 emissions. can be different from case to case, but here you clearly see that truck still has the largest emissions in CO2 compared to the other ones. But you see that there are big differences between the other modalities. So. And then the last one is to anticipate new technologies. So if you anticipate, for example, using other fuels, like DHL in Belgium is using now cars that run on compressed natural gas. Um, you have electric vehicles coming onto the market. So you see here, those are examples of things already available on the market. But not always the most well-known manufacturers, more niche players. Uh, what we did was calculate what the total cost of ownership is of an electric vehicle compared to a normal diesel vehicle. And we see that for the, you just look at the payloads, for the lower payloads, total cost of ownership is very competitive already with the normal cars or the normal trucks. These are vans, more or less. But if you look at the triangles, this is the CO2 emissions. And you can see the ones with the orange labels are including battery costs, so those are the e electric vehicles. You clearly see that the CO2 emissions are way below the CO2 emissions. If you look at it from a total perspective, it's lower than for the classic cars. And what we also see is that there is something shifting. There is a lot of uh, promotion going on, so you get a lot of original manufacturers, the bigger ones that are also coming with, mar with cars on the market. Uh, I don't know if I have still the time, but just to end, I want to say that you see there are lots of ways to reduce carbon in the transport sector, but lots of them fail. And we already saw that with collaboration, what are some of the barriers, but you see that with lots of uh, problems or a lot of solutions, you are involved with many different actors. And that often complicates the thing. If you look at it, for example, in the case of city distribution, which more has an impact on some of the other externalities, you see that lots of uh, concepts fail. A long list of failing consolidation centers, which has an impact, of course. There's bundling and doing one milligram instead of everybody going directly into the city. Many of them failed. And that's to do because you are with a lot of different stakeholders, authorities, citizens, logistics service providers, receivers and shippers, who have different objectives often in different markets. So what's good for one is not always good for the other. And so you need to do something that incorporates the criteria that are being important for the different stakeholders and put it somehow in a framework where you take all the different criteria into account. So then you can work with different instruments to bring all those sensitivities into into card uh, or to uh, 
to assess it and then make a decision. So that was just a short overview of what are possibilities to improve the sustainability of transport. And okay. Excellent. Um, exactly on time also. Um, so that's a nice introduction. I assume that your stinks of transport and environment will be able to relate to this in one or the other way. Um, so I immediately hand the floor to you and uh, do, do we have a presentation? Here I just a few minutes to uh, briefly introduce myself and uh, who I am and my organization. I'm Jost Ings. I've been leading uh, Transport and Environment for a couple of years now. Transport and Environment is uh, not a big household name NGO like WWF or Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. Uh, but still, we try to make a real difference on Europeans and Europe's transport policy. We are the European umbrella NGO. Uh, for all uh, NGOs in Europe working on more sustainable transport. So it's our job to try to make European policy uh, on transport greener. Yeah, that works. So this is an illustration of the variety of areas we work on, whole modes, fuels, and a whole variety of instruments. This is a geographic representation of our membership. The blue ones are the non-EU members, the green ones are EU members. The, uh, number of blanks on the map is decreasing uh, steadily to roughly 50 members. Now this is a quite a basic slide uh, to kick off. Uh, what happened to Europe's transport emissions? And it's, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that transport is the problem child of climate policy in Europe. You see uh, since 1990 steady increase up to 2007. The less well-known story is that since 2007 transport emissions started to fall, of course associated with the economic crisis, but hopefully also some policies uh, made, made a difference. We are now 7% below uh, peak levels in 2007. And I will immediately commit a deadly sin by saying I'm not going to talk about these two sectors, aviation and shipping. Uh, you know, you have to limit somehow, and, uh, but that is not to say we have a very significant campaigns on both sectors, but they are so different uh, from the others that uh, I thought it better to be a bit limited today. So, um, this is the historic emissions trend I just showed you, but of course Europe is not happy uh, about this historic emissions trend, and as uh, Hans already uh, explained, has set some targets for the future. Now for transport, these targets boil down to this graph. Uh, a 60% emissions cut compared with 1990 levels, which is roughly a 70% cut from levels where we are uh, today. Uh, so that's for 2050. That's more or less all right. We don't have a big problem with that. What we do have a problem with is this target, the 2030 target. You see that the curve, the reduction curve, goes something like this. And this is typical in politics. Politicians are very happy to promise very, very steep reductions in the far future. But when it comes down to actually the emissions that they have control over the next 20 years, then the promises become uh, rather less lofty. So what you see is you have a 1% per year emissions cut in the first 20 years, and then suddenly and magically the drop would have to be 5% a year, from 1% to 5%. I don't think that is realistic. So I charted another uh, graph here that would outline if you would cut emissions by 3% every year, what would that look like? And you see here a massive gap in 2030 uh, emissions. So, you know, Europe has set broadly right long-term targets, but with a, a very wrong sense of urgency. There's just no way you're going to reduce emissions by 5% a year after 2030. That's just unfeasible. Uh, the first thing I typically talk about when talking about transport and climate change is pricing. Without proper pricing, then, you know, the other measures just fall flat. And uh, I think a big proof we can find, uh, sorry, we can find in the United States. Uh, an average U.S. citizen uses about three times the amount of transport fuel from a European citizen. And the primary reason, there's a lot of reasons, but the primary reason is that fuel is just ridiculously cheap in the US. So you can buy bigger cars, small cars, you can drive them all. Uh, and uh, rail is also supremely uncompetitive in the US. So you know the power of pricing is, uh, is enormous. Um, and we're quite worried that the issue that road transport should, could be included in the European emissions trading system, you know, 
comes back occasionally, and actually it is coming back uh, as we speak. Uh, I think next week there's a communication uh, uh, coming on what to do with uh, ETS, and including transport is, is outlined as one of the options. Now, why don't we think that is a good idea? In the emissions trading system, we see prices of roughly 10 euros per ton of CO2. Currently, it's a bit lower. It has been a bit higher. Maybe it will go up to 20 or 30 over the next decade or so. But this is kind of the order of magnitude. And that is 2 cents a liter of fuel. So if transport, road transport, would be included in the ETS, the next the net price impact would be 2 cents a liter of CO2. Now, I don't have to tell you that the impact on transport emissions of that would be very, 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 very small. Um, so as a transport abatement strategy, it's quite useful. But more importantly, once transport is in the ETS, every single industry that gets measures, you know, proposed on it in the transport sector will say, well, we have the ETS, there's no problem, there's a cap. You know, if we emit more, somebody else will emit less. And, uh, uh, you know, you see it currently in the aviation in the aviation industry that is already in the ETS. The, actually, the political support to take extra measures in the transport sector, climate measures, will evaporate from the moment transport is in the ETS. Thirdly, the argument is, well, it's, it's very economically efficient if the ETS is expanded to other sectors. I would also really like to argue with that, because the ETS is severely constrained by the energy intensive industries that Hans just talked about. They always threaten with carbon leakage. You know, if you, if you uh, raise the price too high, we will move overseas and we will produce our steel and aluminium and etc. elsewhere. With transport, that is just impossible. You cannot move a trip from London to Paris, you know, to China. That is not possible. So transport is not footloose. So you can be much tougher in transport than in, in exposed sectors. And the current fuel prices and fuel taxes show that, that doesn't lead to any sort of significant leakage. So the message is don't put all sorts of completely disparate sectors with different characteristics into one system that is likely to end up as a lowest common denominator system that will not go beyond what heavy industry can bear. And uh, we have a massive oil import bill. Who has ever said that uh, taxing uh, imported oil is a worse idea than taxing labor? So, you know, I would argue that the optimal carbon prices in transport are much, much higher than optimal carbon prices in industry. This is what I was talking about. The oil import bill uh, is going up relentlessly. It currently stands roughly at a billion uh, euros each day. And so roughly two thirds of that is for transport. So, you know, I, I would argue that uh, a tax on fuel, as we currently have, is quite an efficient way of raising government revenue. Yeah. So you have, I would put, put this argument in a bit of a broader context in, in transport. Uh, I think Tom also briefly talked about it. You have this philosophy that we should internalize external costs and after that we are more or less finished. I would say inter internalizing external costs is really step number one. That eliminates the distortions in an economy. That makes the economy function more smoothly. But after that, you get a much more difficult question. You know, how can we raise revenues, pay for hospitals, etc., in an efficient way? And by no means, I would say that that putting putting an extra tax on fuel, for example, or on transport itself, is a worse idea than putting putting it on labour. And as a matter of fact, I, I I'm actually quite frustrated with. Uh, the fact that there is not a serious NGO worldwide in Europe or at a national level that outlining the benefits of a green tax shift. What we're currently doing is just crazy. We tax labor to death. We are surprised that we have unemployment. And we don't tax carbon very heavily. And we're surprised we have a lot of carbon emissions. And you know, this story needs to be told. And by no means, I think, that this story is politically killing. You know, I will come back to that. A bit later, but there are some good examples of uh, what you can do. This is what happened to fuel taxes since uh, 1980, actually. Corrected for inflation, I must say that. That's corrected for inflation, but you know, we correct everything for inflation, so why not fuel taxes? Actually, the surprising result is fuel taxes peaked in Europe in 1989. <coughs> they have gone down ever since. The fact that oil has, that the pump has become more expensive as a result of higher oil prices on the world market. But also, 
uh, you know, everything becomes more expensive. Bread is also a lot more expensive than it was 20 or 30 years ago, and somehow we find it much easier to accept than in the case of fuel. But, you know, I wanted to say that if you talk about a green tax shift, you lose votes. That's the general paradigm. And I don't think that's true. If you look, who has done, who has undertaken the most courageous action on fuel taxation in Europe in the past three years has been Mario Monti. He's the most popular Italian politician at the moment. You know, uh, I'm not saying that that's because he raised fuel taxes, but by no means, you know, voters are not children and they understand that sometimes it is, it is uh, uh, necessary to, to, do, uh, to do the right thing if you explain it properly. And also the German and Swedish and Dutch government did massive green tax reforms without being electorally very badly punished. Now, so the question is, what are the reasons that people are not willing to put up fuel taxes? Of course, politics is one, but there is a second explanation. Actually, the colors on this slide are not, not fantastic, but uh, they look better on the screen. But, you know, this little tiny country of Luxembourg is a nice example of what's going on. This country is getting rich by keeping its fuel taxes low, which means not so much that you and I in our cars when we go on holidays fill up, we also do that, but the amount of liters involved is quite low. The trucks, that's the real issue. Trucks, on one tank, they can do almost all of Europe. They have tanks of over a thousand liters. So what you do if you have to move from here to here, you just make sure you make a stop there, you fill up. And so Luxembourg gets all the tax revenues by keeping its taxes low. Now, that's a politically irresistible proposition. So, you know, you get a sort of a race to the bottom, and that's why Europe has an energy tax directive that puts, puts a, a floor in these, in these fuel taxes. So, uh, um, and it's not just Luxembourg, it's also uh, Slovenia. And, uh, Slovenia, for example, has also uh, morphed into a fuel tax haven uh, in recent years. They've also discovered, uh, discovered this trick. So in the short term, we just need to put up higher, uh, you know, our, our, our minimum, minimum taxes in Europe to make, to make it possible, actually, for, for, for countries uh, with higher taxes to increase further, to, to basically address the fuel tax havens. And we need to, to work with a political cell. That's a, a real, real, real concern. But in the long term, uh, Europe is still, uh, voting on taxation is still in unanimity. And that makes it extremely difficult to move forward. And I do believe that one of the things that should be on the table when we currently discuss more tight integration in the Eurozone, if you talk about banking union, why, uh, which, is, which is a very aggressive move towards integration, why couldn't we talk about ending majority voting on green taxes, for example? Uh, I don't think that it's a much more radical or drastic measure. And I think that should be put on the table. No story about pricing is complete without uh, picturing the two biggest subsidy junkies, uh, as you can call them, aviation, no VAT, no fuel taxes, massive subsidies for regional airports, stimulated by the European Commission, uh, by the way, and uh, um, company cars. This country is an extremely good example of uh, uh, very, very high subsidies for company cars, and you can see the result every day in the inner city. Uh, and every morning on the Rue de la Loire. So, that's, that's the tax story. I think it's really very, very important to price transport properly. Now, there's another side to taxation, which is spending. We have uh, uh, quite a bit of EU spending. It's not the 10 t pot of money. That's a low amount of money. It's a billion a year. Actually, the majority of spending goes through cohesion funds, through the poorer countries and uh, you know I don't want to talk about it too long happy to answer all sorts of questions but unfortunately this picture here is too good an illustration of what's happening with that money and you know I wish it, it was a joke but it's and of course it's a bit a, it's a bit of an exaggeration but the current way Europe spends its cohesion money has incentives that lead countries that that lead countries to take European money uh, for free motorways. So what countries typically do, they use their own money to, to build tolled motorways, so motorways that actually uh, they think users are willing to pay for, which are generally you know, the motorways for which there's demand, the more sensible kind of investment. 
And you don't take European money for that because uh, you have to pay back the European money if you run it back with tolls. So you build free motorways and free motorways are typically the kind of motorways for which there is far, far less demand than for the toll motorways. So, and this, this is a typical picture of a Spanish, uh, of a Spanish motorway, a country that has binged on, on uh, infrastructure investments and built far too much. Um, so we need to repair these incentives in the cohesion funding and we are working very hard to make that, uh, make that happen. Then we have a very other important other, other policies are the sort of the technical requirements for the vehicles and the fuels. This is another very important European policy area that we work on. I want to start with efficiency standards. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this was a campaign poster we used for our campaign to get European legislation to make cars more fuel efficient uh, four or five years ago. We uh, actually dug up uh, the first model of Volkswagen and we compared it with what the current model of, model of Volkswagen uh, used in terms of fuel and actually it was exactly the same amount. It was just too good to be true. So we made a nice big campaign poster in the head of a parliament vote. And uh, in the end, it ended up in the European legislation to force car makers to make their cars more fuel efficient. So this uh, is a curve of what happened since. So you see relatively slow progress in those years before that legislation and then suddenly after the legislation, all the manufacturers here suddenly started to make their cars a lot more fuel efficient and CO2 emissions went down really quite quickly. Actually this is an unpublished graph, you're the first audience that I'm going to show this to, so uh, we're going to we, uh, publish this in, uh, in two weeks or so. Uh, but there's a snag, there's a snag. The reality is unfortunately a bit worse. This is another graph and another organization, but these are the official CO2 <coughs> figures, more or less the same pattern as I just showed. But actually, if you ask users what is the actual fuel consumption of your car, then they report something like this. And the two curves are comparable. They are similar cars. So, um, so the real world fuel consumption in everyday life is improving much, much more slowly than the official CO2 figures uh, suggest. And this is a real worry. And we're also, we also going to address this uh, uh, quite happily next year. There's, there's a lot, a big story behind it. <coughs> but not, not, not for now. Uh, yeah. Then uh, in the field of aviation, something similar is happening. Hardly any progress in fuel efficiency, contrary to what the industry might want you to believe. This is a very, very old aircraft, 1958 Lockheed Constellation. This is a modern aircraft, actually one of the best selling aircraft uh, still at the moment. And they use, they use just the same amount of fuel. Um, and this graph shows why. This is a propeller aircraft, the Lockheed Constellation. And then came the jet aircraft and fuel consumption shot up by a factor three. And then they started to improve jet aircraft and we are now back to where we were with, with propellers. So it's, it's, it's a story that you see much more often. Of course, today's aircraft are a lot better than the Lockheed Constellation. They fly fast and they fly higher and more comfortable and etc. But they don't use less fuel. And the same is true for cars. We, they're bigger, they're more comfortable, they're safer, they're faster, more powerful, etc. Don't use so much less fuel. So uh, I'm happy to say that ICAO, the worldwide aviation body, uh, is doing, apart from a lot of harmful things, also something useful. They're trying to develop a CO2 standard for new aircraft. So maybe, maybe we'll see some improvement over there. Um, Shall we go into this? No, I don't think so. Then on the fuel side, there's a lot of development on the transport fuel side. This is another quite complicated graph. These are fossil fuels. This is carbon footprints of different types of fossil fuels, well to wheel, so from exploration to actually combustion. These are biofuels. These are the direct effects of biofuels that are typically included in life cycle analysis. You see that they are typically below the fossil fuels. But the light blue is actually uh, the indirect land use change emissions. It's the latest hype uh, in the biofuel country. And what you actually see here is the biodiesels. Is that actually biodiesels are comparable, if not worse, than the fossil fuels they are supposed to replace. And these are Canadian tar sands, for example. Although the Canadians, uh, you know, of course, heavily contest uh, these figures. So this gives you a bit of a picture of uh, what Europe is trying to do 
we're trying to carbon footprint different transport fuels and then regulate the carbon footprint down. Is that policy successful? Not so, not really so on biofuels. The Commission has just made a major U-turn by making a proposal to actually uh, slow down on our expansion of biofuels because we are heading in the wrong direction. And of fossil fuels, uh, Canada and the oil industry have joined in an unholy alliance to fight efforts uh, you know, that Europe should open up its market for, for tar sand based uh, petrol and diesel. Europe is still resisting uh, and we're also trying to, trying to uh, address that. So in a very, very short you know, summary, you could say that hydrocarbon fuels, so fossil fuels and biofuels, both hydrocarbon fuels, are actually not really decarbonizing. And they are refusing to have themselves decarbonized. They are refusing to actually uh, accept legislation that would force their carbon footprint down. So, you know, if hydrocarbon fuels are not going to do it, what is then going to do it? And everybody talks about electric, uh, uh, electric cars and e-mobility. Made a big report on this uh, a couple of years back, and I can summarize a bit of the thinking. You can do e-mobility the wrong way, you can do it the right way. It can be a massive opportunity. It can also bury, uh, bear quite a few risks. Now, uh, we think the key obstacle for e-mobility is this thing: is the battery. It's huge. It's costly, heavy, uh, and dirty. It holds a lot of energy and a lot of mm. rare, rare metals and etc. So any e-mobility needs to minimize the dependence of these things to be successful. You know, if there were no battery, if the battery were as good as a petrol tank, every single piece of mobility people could think of were electric because the electric engine is, is fantastic. It's the storage, that's the issue. Subsidizing private cars, the favorite policy of government, actually subsidizes the battery because if you buy a, a battery car and you get 5,000 euros on top, that is actually an attempt to subsidize the battery away. So you're subsidizing the problem, you're not really solving the problem of, of the battery. So in many ways, this is not, not a very effective policy. So you know, there's other ways to think about this. We think uh, e-mobility offers a massive opportunity to completely rethink mobility concepts. So the space between a bike and a car is going to be filled up in the next two decades. You know, with all sorts of advanced uh, mobility uh, concepts, this is the most basic, a regular bike with a battery. This is something that resembles most the car, there are no twizzy, but this space is where I believe that the real chance for e-mobility is. And we need to, we need to reap it smaller, lighter vehicles that actually can perform well uh, on a battery that don't need a, need a uh, petrol or diesel. The second thing is we need to look and stimulating e-mobility in car sharing schemes and in fleet and not so much with private people because if you share the battery you share out the cost with many people uh, but the fun of driving an electric car at almost zero cost that's for everybody so you share the burden and uh, but you still enjoy the full benefits much more cost-effective strategy to focus on collective vehicles car sharing is of course a good example of much more sustainable mobility so again a, a big opportunity of course, these car sharing schemes, you know, intermodal hotspots are ideal places to roll these things out. So uh, that's another thing. And last but not least, I do think we need to look at how can we get electricity into mm -hmm. vehicles without a battery. And there's two ways, conduction, this is uh, an experiment with a trolley truck, and induction, actually building uh, induction uh, lines in, in the tarmac. These are two ways that you also don't need a battery. If you look at actually the cost of these kind of strategies compared with the battery, this is so much cheaper you know, to do it this way. It looks expensive, but you know, overall it's, it's a lot cheaper. So uh, this is of course not ready for tomorrow, but my worry is that not enough people are paying attention, that it's not forefront in, in research and uh, development uh, policies and <coughs> budgets. This needs to be looked at much more seriously. I just don't believe hydrocarbons, biofuels, and fossil fuels are going to happen. This is for you to look over later. It summarizes the whole thing. So, summarizing, uh, summarizing the, the presentation, we need urgency. The 2030 strategy targets are just not good enough. That's one. Uh, green tech shift absolutely indispensable. 
and it's not the political pill that people think it is. It can be done. We need to change the incentives in Europe's transport spending so that uh, um, they actually go to more sensible projects than, uh, than over the past seven years. Um, the efficiency standards that we are introducing now with cars and vans, but also in trucks and aircraft and ships, great instrument, but they must deliver in the real world. We must measure these emissions more better than we do now. Hydrocarbons are ruling themselves out as we speak. These industries just refuse to have their carbon footprint measured and regulated. So, for me, that's they are very close to being the end of the story. And um, e mobility, uh, lots of opportunities, also a couple of risks, and I didn't talk about, but you know, a good, a well designed e mobility strategy, I think, uh, can get us uh, quite a long way towards more sustainable transport. So you see how different my speech was compared to Tom's. <laughs> There's no such thing as universal wisdom, but maybe these two pieces uh, uh, pieces fit well together. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, and perhaps we can give a first applause to all three speakers. <laughs> We've covered quite a few. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps you can come up to the front here. Um, it was a tough ride <laughs> with uh, lots of content. Um, to make us aware of what we are dealing with, I thought I could put one slide on the screen. Which way was this? Underwater transport? It's this one. Well, it could be that one. Where, what's, what's happening? Not. Right. Yes, <laughs> it was the difficult one <laughs> because that that uh, gives us both of the sectors. Um, I don't know whether that was behind our thinking of putting the two sectors together, but it also shows you that the power sector that was dealt with um, two weeks ago basically has to decarbonize, whereas industry and transport, at least in the in the low carbon roadmap. Uh, actually retain some, um, some some level of emissions. I guess uh, industry you will know better is kind of minus 75 or something mm -hmm. like that percent or 70, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and transport, as we heard, minus 60, um, which could actually pose a problem, as you will probably be aware, because the EU target is 80 to 95, and this is 80, so if you need to go to 95, then 60% in the transport sector will not be enough, although we have learned in the meantime that I think the Council of Transport Ministers thought obviously that minus 60 is absolutely unrealistic and can't be achieved. So just as a, as a little bit of background, so we have both sectors on there and what, what the challenge is uh, for, for those sectors. Um, and that way we um, perhaps open the floor for comments and questions for the discussion. If you could please yeah. always identify yourself so that yeah. the speakers also know who's yeah. asking. My name is Volker Herlin. I'm a consultant in the hydrocarbon processing industry and try to minimize energy. Mm -hmm. So to follow where you're looking for. Now, when I see the reduction for industry, then uh, I will not say it is impossible. I think, I think it is impossible. Mm -hmm. but uh, the question, what came up during the start, so we should be constructive, is that uh, I see huge investments in the Arab countries where the hydrocarbon processing um, is moved to uh, commodity products. That means they convert in the um, crude oil into, um, through steam crackers into the acetone and deliver them the products to Europe. That means the industry that is currently partly here will move more to the uh, Arab countries where then the CO2 uh, will be blown into the atmosphere. Now, how is it counting on this? I assume that when we reduce the number of chemical plants and refineries in Europe, then the curve will go down. Is that correct in your counting? Uh, when yes, we reduce yes. the industry yeah, here. Yeah. Yes. So, but it may not... Uh, on the other hand, counteracting is a fact that the transport will increase, but the transport is relatively cheap because the transport will be by barge yeah. and by ship. Yeah, yeah. So overall, this 
can be managed if you move out the production into other countries. But from standpoint of, let's say, physical and chemical uh, uh, law, uh, it will not be possible in case we keep the industry here. So this is one point I have, uh, a comment as a consultant from my experience. The other question I have is, what can be done to help better predicting where uh, and how and which risk policy we should get uh, CO2 reduction. My proposal, not only here but in other places for this discussion, is to learn to model these kind of things. We can model weather, we can model uh, even the electric grid, which you know is a bottleneck at this time, to uh, increase the low the, the uh, power generation from the North Sea into the countries, into the South. Uh, the networks are perfectly modeled. They have the tools to say we need to increase this line and that line from the north to the south. But I do not see that the European uh, experts help to model the situation here and make the policy then based on improved understanding of the interaction between what is happening there because there is an interaction between power sector and industry, uh, residual uh, and, uh, and others, and transport. So uh, one will impact the other. So you reduce in one, but may increase somewhere else. So I feel that the modeling should be done more properly and should be used to increase the policy. What is the current status on this kind of thinking? Okay, let's, let's c try to collect uh, uh, a few. Yes. I don't know to what extent you are an expert on modeling, but <laughs> mm, everybody has heard about the models that the commission is running there. Um, anyone else? Yes, so um, we take <laughs> there in the second row. Uh, we can collect a few, I guess. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Antonis. I'm a former VB and EA student, and I'm now a Ruberist. Uh, as was also known as working for transport organizations, usually for uh, industry-related uh, sectors. Um, I, I fully, I mean, firstly, very good presentation. They were, uh, I really enjoyed them, also on a visual level. Um, that I fully agree with you that there is an issue with taxation, and I'm always maybe as frustrated as you also about uh, the Commission fighting with one arm on its back, because indeed taxation is uh, unanimity among member states. And uh, it's, I don't think it's even a political issue towards the people. It's just that you know everyone likes to keep its money close, and member states are the same. So there's the current energy taxation directive, also looking at the CO2 element in fuel, and it's uh, really not an easy negotiation. So that was a question I wanted to make, but Jules addressed it. So my, my other question is about personal taxation and transparency. Since I work uh, 10 years in the, in the sector, I'm a big favor of shifting taxation from ownership based of, of a car and go into a usage based scheme as, as Rossi is saying basically in a second step. Uh, first, first you have to be transparent about it and, uh, and I, uh, it's very difficult. Again, I, the Commission is sort of not, not allowed to, to impose this on passenger cars and again they're looking at taxing trucks which is about 10% of the traffic. So uh, that would be a question to the Commission, how difficult would it be uh, to, to get passenger cars involved and finally as a Brussels resident you can say Brussels made you do this in all member states this time I wouldn't mind because usually <laughs> I might and my last point on that is that once I tried to ask at the Brussels Ministry of Economy can I, I know as an independent how much taxes I pay I don't know where they are going could I get an overview on a yearly basis on where are my taxes being distributed and if I know that every day I pay uh, for example a euro for public transport but I never use it I might start thinking, okay, with an extra euro, I could actually better use public transport for this particular uh, trip uh, and not pay uh, two euros to use my car again, uh, because I, I do like to have my car, and I don't use it that much, so that's why I would like to be taxed on it too, so that's a bit my, my point. Okay, let's try to take two more, and you keep, keep notes if you please, here in the front. My name is Chris Keller, Universe Scientific will be developed next generation energy technologies. I have a question for Tom. You started your presentation saying that uh, the passenger transport will actually 
uh, uh, creating most emissions. Yes. And then the rest of your presentation was about, not about, about this subject. So I was uh, <coughs> interested to know if you could perhaps also talk a little bit about that. Mm. And Claire? Um, Claire from Hawking Institute for Future for Urban Studies. I have a very specific question for you, Jos. Uh, it was your graph about the real world CO2 figures. I was wondering why is that different? Is it because of driving habits or is it something else? Like, what is that difference between the official and real world figures? Okay, let's perhaps draw a line here. Perhaps we'll see how long the responses take and take a couple of questions after that still. Hans, do you want to start addressing the, I guess, the first two mm -hmm. questions? Yes. Potentially, I don't know mm -hmm. whether you can talk about the taxation issue also. Yeah. Yeah. I think the both uh, first and second questions are a bit related about is this realistic or not? And um, is it, uh, how do we model? Because okay, I was not directly involved, but I understood that this has been uh, made based on models, which are quite sophisticated as far as I understand. And uh, for example, for industry, as I mentioned, and all of that, that is based on available technology in principle, where CCS is, of course, one. And one can, of course, discuss the cost. Is it, really, is it, you know, does it, is it feasible from a cost perspective? But um, uh, it is at least, uh, as far as I understood, supposed to be possible. Now I know for sector, Perhaps not, you know, it's, it's, it's different per sectors, not every sector should be reduced the same. And uh, that model is, is um, modeling the whole economy, so it's all the sectors together. So, for example, <coughs> I think that one reason to reduce industry emissions is that they should use, go from fossil fuel to electricity to some extent in certain sectors. And then, of course, it's linked to industry, so there would be more electricity production, but then there should then be, of course, low carbon electricity production. So that is how it's intended. One can, of course, uh, discuss is this realistic or how is it modeled. Everybody has opinions, but I think those models that I use are relatively well established models. In, uh, so that's perhaps. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, well, there was a question on. You to me, I don't know. I, I don't work in transport, so to be honest, um, I don't think I can say so much. But I can agree, of course, what you said. Taxation is in the EU context, and what you said very much also is that it's uh, unanimity um, with the member states to discuss. So it's very difficult for the Commission to uh, get its proposals adopted. Although it should be said that in general in the EU most legislation is adopted by unanimity, but it's very different if you know you can block it or if you know you can be outvoted, because then you're much more likely to try to find some kind of uh, something that can make you accept it. And then, but uh, if you know you can say no, and then you can just sit back and not even want to do negotiate. But on the use, on, uh, for example, land is to uh, use, it should be cheaper to e own a car and more expensive to use it. Uh, I, I'm not an expert. But maybe it's the mm -hmm. risk that people buy more than they need and then they use it after all. Because I have a car myself and when it's in front of my door, I use it much more than when it's in the garage, five minutes walk away. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's very simple. Yeah. But you might know but this better. Well, uh, yeah, the fundamental principle is that the tax on use is more efficient than an ownership. Yeah, it does affect demand more. But, uh, you know, in these, this time and age, you know, taxing a car itself, uh, you know, particularly if you tax a very expensive car, you know that uh, it's kind of a low risk way to raise revenue as well. So, you know, you have to, you have to limit your, your ambitions. And particularly if you're not a car producer, what you're actually doing is taxing a foreign car producer indirectly. You know, so uh, uh, for a tax minister, a tax on a car, uh, an expensive car, it, it takes a lot of boxes, you know, to raise revenue in a very attractive way. Now, on this unanimity issue, I am really quite surprised that nobody in the current context where the Eurozone is taking one drastic measure after the other for more tight economic supervision, centralized, you know, control of budget, that there's talk of a European finance minister, that there's talk of, you know, centralized Eurozone budget, that you have a European 
uh, you know, bank, uh, bank uh, union, at least a, a guarantee fund for banks, which is a very, very fundamental change in the way of, you know, financial interdependencies that are relatively straightforward uh, uh, thing to prevent tax profiteering, because that's what it actually is, uh, uh, you know, cannot be adopted. I'm not saying that Europe should harmonize all sorts of taxes, that's not what I'm saying, you know, but there are cases where you have this race to the bottom, where you have these perverse incentives that countries can, over the back of their neighbors, you know, have lower tax rates and attract more capital as a result. Now, not, that's not often a bad thing, but in the case of fuel taxes, it's clearly a bad, uh, a, bad, a bad thing. So, for these categories of taxes, I'm quite surprised that nobody is yet, you know, at least on a, on a very high level, discussing whether we should you know, make it a bit more difficult to give uh, Luxembourg uh, a veto right. So I'm not, I'm not saying it should be full co-decision, but there's a lot of light between unanimity and, and full co-decision. Mm -hmm. you know, on, on the budget, we also have a special voting procedure on the, on the, on the, on the multi-annual mm -hmm. framework. You know, why couldn't we, you know, under strict conditions, move to something more advanced on, on <coughs> forms of taxation where competition is detrimental? You know, uh, that's because not all tax competition is detrimental, but some forms are. So. That's my point. Um, on the real world, that's very much more specific uh, uh, question. Uh, no, it's not that we suddenly drive different uh, from what we, did, what we did 10 years ago, and it's also not that the test has changed or anything. What has happened is that uh, car makers have become much more adept in using uh, the loopholes that are in there. Uh, previously, they tested more according to the spirit of the legislation. Now they are tested to the law. So everything that's not specifically outlawed is done. And we're having evidence that it goes to quite extreme lengths. For example, for example, you can measure the resistance values. You know, when you everybody thinks it's just one test of a car in a lab and you measure the emissions and that's it. But before you test it in the lab, just like you go to a fitness club, you actually need to set the resistance of the rolls. Know, that your tire is on. You know, whether it's a heavy car, it's more resistance, or a lighter car, more aerodynamic. Or, now, and these settings are determined in an outdoor test. And it, gets, it gets very technical, but you first take your car outdoors to measure it in the, you know, on, a, on a track, and then you set put the settings in the lab. Now, you have to, you know, what, what then happens is you have to uh, decelerate your car, from different speeds, 20 and 40 and 50 and 80 to zero. And then you measure how long it rolls and then you can see, okay, is this aerodynamic and you have so much rolling resistance because it rolls like that. You have to do that in two directions because of the wind. You know, If you have a storm in this direction, you have to also take the storm in that direction within an hour. That's but what it doesn't. And there's another rule that says you the, it doesn't have to be completely flat. It can be one and a half percent tilted. What it doesn't say is that you have to use the same track back and forth. So, yeah, there is a track in Europe that actually uh, enables them to measure downhill in two ways. Just one example, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we are gathering all these pieces of evidence, and, you know, next, next uh, year will be. Uh, you will know, we'll start to you know, expose the soda. But this is the reason. A gram of CO2 is now worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If you have a car below 100 grams of CO2, <coughs> you have a lot of tax credit in a lot of countries, and you also score good in the EU's regulation, don't have to pay penalties and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they are now squeezing every last gram out of the cycle. And uh, it must also be said, apart from the technical prescriptions of the test cycle is also something really rotten in the way Europe's test uh, uh, is Europe's vehicle testing is organized because you have dozens of type approval authorities and they all are sort of semi or completely privatized so they compete for business so you know they compete you know I can test your car and get even a lower figure you know that's the sort of that's the sort of competition between them and there is hardly any central oversight on these practices and most of the time there's actually really nobody there physically there from a government to check whether these tests are 
you know, in that sense, we can learn a lot from the United States. You know, they are so much tougher uh, in terms of regulatory oversight. And implementation in Europe is, you know, we have lots of lofty goals and ambitions and targets, and uh, but implementation is a really big problem. And if the Americans, they have far more relaxed legislation, but if they have it, it actually means something. They're, they're very interesting. Obviously, raises the question that the graph that you start your your, your presentation with, like it's it's possible we can go down. Uh, perhaps means we're not really going that much down, as 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 the measurements at least would suggest. No, a large extent is of course uh, the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to a large extent, it's but always impossible to disentangle this precisely. Mm -hmm. but, uh, But yeah, no, uh, policies are less effective than we hope they are. I mean, that's that's a fact. So, you know, you need to be tougher than you think you have to be. And secondly, you need to work a lot on implementation. You know, that's, mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. Yeah. Tom. Okay. Really? Sorry. <laughs> Passenger transport, I think there were two reasons why I did not touch it too much. The time constraints in the yeah. presentation and also the fact that my own research is more related to sustainable logistics, <coughs> but we also work on sustainable mobility and you can implement those four A's exactly the same way on passenger transport. If you look at the first one, awareness, I think it's very important for people to be aware of what the impact is of choosing a particular transport mode. Often people are just not aware what the carbon footprint is of those different transport modes. So I think you have lots of carbon footprint calculators now that are available. But there you have the problem that it's not always clear which methodology is behind it and you can get very diverse um, carbon footprint calculations, but it's already a start. People can do some calculations going from A to B. What does it cost me if I take the train or use my car? Um, if you look at avoidance, um, here you have the same thing. Yeah? On a higher level you could put people or move people closer to their work. You can also do it the other way around, get work to the people at home, like teleworking. Uh, we did some study on this for the Brussels capital region, looking at companies who provided the possibility to telework on two levels, uh, working at the satellite office. So you have satellite offices in uh, Mechelen, uh, smaller cities uh, closer where the people live. Or you could really uh, promote home working. Uh, what we saw is that with working in a satellite office, you have to be careful of the shifts in uh, the modal shifts that occur. We had uh, mm -hmm. people who came to Brussels by train and who drove by car to the satellite office. Mm -hmm. So there you have perverse effects mm -hmm. of people uh, allowing people to work at the satellite office. That, of course, drops if you get them the ability to work at home. That's the best solution, of course, because that's avoiding complete trips. Um, what you also have uh, in avoidance, what we saw with freight bundling, you have that with people bundling, carpooling. Um, but he, the complex adaptive system that you have with freight bundling also plays a bit with carpooling. You have lots of barriers, more also on a personal level, where people have to match if they want to join cars. Uh, you lose some flexibility, you have to adapt time windows, people have to get to the same places at the same time. So it's not that easy to impose carpooling systems. Um, if you look at uh, act and shift, that's more like uh, shifting transport modes. There you have the what you have with intermodal transport. That cost structure does not play with shifting from car transport to public transport because prices in uh, in private transport are not that clear or visible. If you take for example, a bus in Belgium, if you take one in Flanders, the ticket price you pay only covers 13% of the actual price. So you do not have a clear view on what's the real social price of a public transport movement. But what you have there that people use uh, when they make that shift is more like uh, what you have there with cost is with time. The transshipments uh, cost extra time for people. If you take your car, you don't have to, de to do those transshipments. And it's those transshipments that keep people away often from public transport. The um, certainty of the transshipment time, the fact that it's not always that reliable, 
Um, it's a, a problem for shifting from car to public transport. So quite some studies on that. And then with the anticipation of new technologies, you also have the electric vehicle uh, story that's also apparently uh, for, for passenger cars. And there you have the problem of uh, getting the infrastructure and it's a chicken egg problem of uh, providing the infrastructure. Maybe. But those four A's are also implementable in passenger mm -hmm. cars. Thanks. Can we go back to Hans? Because uh, there's still the outstanding question on carbon leakage and if industries move, uh, etc. Yeah, <coughs> I forgot to mention that. <coughs> so I think I mentioned this in my presentation that, of course, it's all the time a balance between uh, pushing our industry too much. They might decide to uh, move out slowly or quickly, or you never know how. And um, Therefore, we have a different system. We have a lot of free allocation to industry, for example, to reduce the cost in ETS. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. of course, the world is changing and changing fast, and a lot of things are happening. And what you mentioned, these Arab countries, some of them are now they are building big uh, petrochemical plants. Of course, they have some kind of political support. Of course, they have very cheap raw material. They have land probably for free, and they have these guest workers who have no salaries. So, of course, it all makes it very attractive with or without our climate uh, policies. So that is, of course, some of this sort of big carbon leakage that might not be due to climate policy. I think it's the same with uh, the fact that China has become now producer a lot of the things we are doing. I think most of us, if you buy uh, some uh, new um, ceramics in IKEA, it's, it might be made in China instead of it was used to made in Europe, and that is somehow carbon leakage you can say, but it's not, I think normally we talk about carbon leakage if it's due to our climate policies, but then it's a bit more the perverse the outcome, but if it's due to other things, it's a bit la vie. But I, I know there, there is a more and more debate about this uh, issue of imported uh, carbon in the products you buy, and there have been some studies about it, and uh, even the Chinese, for example, sometimes said that we should be responsible for the CO2 they emit for the products that we buy. But personally, I think they also, that is not a good idea because they make money on the products they buy. They should take responsibility. And we also export products always, so it would be difficult. But nevertheless, it's an interesting concept that maybe we in the Europe are not so good as the some of the figures show because we buy a lot of stuff and throw it away. And a lot of CO2 is happening there. So it's the, the issue is interesting and I think there will be more debate now. So the next step is carbon tax adjustments on the, at the border. <laughs> of course, <laughs> some people think we should have that. Yeah, right. That is uh, the red herring somehow. Um, nobody has raised it, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, we have time for a couple of more questions. Harry? Hi, uh, Harik, I'm a researcher here at the IAS. <coughs> I have two questions. First one is, uh, personal one uh, to Jos. You mentioned uh, this either jogging and uh, this track where you can go downhill both ways. I would really love to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but the more serious question is that um, on your uh, uh, figures on iLook, uh, you, you had an average figure which seemed to be very kind of fixed. But as far as I know, there seems to be a huge amount of let's say uncertainty, not just uh, that different people come up with different figures, but I understand that the main point is that it is really difficult to come up with a definitive figure because it is so case dependent, where do you do it, how do you do it, you know, well, there are so many variables to that, that measuring it in any sensible way uh, seems difficult, and adding to that, <coughs> if you start, uh, let's say, putting that type of measurement on fuels, you might then ask why only fuels, there are many other things if you look at consumption of raw food and other things where you also are causing ILOC type of effects, so why would you limit them that to only fuel? So do you have any views on these two interrelated questions? Yeah. Wait, please think. Oh, oh I need to <laughs> My short-term memory is still good. <laughs> I have oh, saw uh, the <laughs> Transport and the Commission's proposal for a single European transport area 
Um, the Commission set up a very ambitious goal for 2030 and 2050 for free clean urban uh, development and infrastructure, like uh, phasing out of conventional to target 2050 oh, yeah. and uh, also 50% shift of this yeah. long long to freight transport to, to, to rail and, um, and to shipping. But uh, however, the problem is that, uh, most, uh, as you already mentioned with the implementation, is that the EU has very limited competence uh, mm. in the area of urban planning and also infrastructure yeah. development, so that the implementation would depend very much on commitment by municipalities yeah. and supporting member states. So uh, maybe also to the Commission's representative, and how far the Commission is reconciling national uh, also strategies with its goals and how far stakeholders are also uh, included in this process and how we could better make the uh, both levels work to so the, the micro level and the European level. <laughs> Two minutes to eight. Um, <laughs> oh, there's one in the back. Uh, okay, please. Uh, the EU has mentioned all the points uh, for the network of citizen regions for sustainable transport. Uh, I have a question related to the electric cars, which are for personal use. And my question is, is it true that currently they are actually producing more CO2 emissions than, than reducing the CO2 emissions because, uh, because of the lack of the infrastructure, and you mentioned as well, we can't actually use them on long distances, and so people basically use them as a second car, next to the normal car which uses petrol. So basically they uh, produce more CO2 emissions Okay, so perhaps perhaps we draw a line here. Already some depletion in the audience going on. Uh, can I ask uh, just to uh, first on ILAC, Yeah, uh, scientific uncertainty. Of course, these these uh, this graph are the figures that the Commission uses to underpin its proposal. So that's sort of the official figures. And of course there's a bandwidth. And of course there's scientific uncertainty. Nobody denies that. But there's also a scientific uncertainty with the direct emissions, with the life cycle. And what all the science says is that the ILIC is a very significant problem. You know, and if you draw, for example, a parallel to the debt crisis, we have a very significant debt crisis. You know, we don't have to uh, argue about that, but the, the recipes and you know all the models that are that are run to to assess the policies to resolve that debt crisis, how much we should do austerity, how much we should they all come with widely different outcomes. Doesn't mean we should address we should not try to address the debt crisis <laughs> as well as we could. You know. Scientific uncertainty is a concept of life, and I think ILAC is a very easily understandable and logical concept in a way if you use more land to grow biofuels you know, that you didn't use before, then it is quite logical that somehow we will use some more land, whether it will be entirely replaced somebody, somewhere else, or whether it will be absorbed through higher prices and less consumption. You know? that's open to debate, but that we will have more pressure on the agricultural system that will emerge somewhere on the globe. You know, that is quite logical. And if it's not, then the alternative is that, that we go hungry because we don't produce more. So it is a, a question, either we use more land or we produce less. So, you know, and the thing is that, that, that let's say, the people who don't want this policy deny that, both, that either of these are happening. So biofuels do not lead to higher food prices and to, uh, you know, so worse access to food and do not lead to a higher land use. One of them must be wrong, <laughs> you know. Uh, so that's <laughs> long answer to that. Then uh, should it, we don't apply it to other things either. No, we don't apply it to beef. You know, the carbon footprint of beef is, uh, is very high. We should eat less, less beef if we want to reduce, uh, reduce the carbon footprint. But we actually do have an active policy to introduce biofuels you know, in Europe and to promote them and we set public targets for them on the, on the premise that they offer public goods. Nobody is arguing that eating beef has any sort of external benefit beyond the, what the market has to offer us, so we don't set targets for eating beef or for buying air tickets for that matter. You know? So that's really a fundamental difference. If you say we want to use 
this many of this stuff because we think it's a good idea. It's actually, you know, the burden of the proof that it's actually a good idea is on the person who set that target. You know, so. Um, com uh, the, the competence uh, as regards EU targets, I do agree with you that quite a few of these white paper targets are fairly fanciful, you know, and that uh, they, they have high wishful thinking kind of, and I did wish that the Commission were more ambitious on, on the areas that they did have competence about. For example, you know, we need to make sure that by 2030 all our cars that are come to the EU market emit 90% less carbon than they do currently. You know, that's much more competence. They didn't do that. They instead said, we shouldn't have cars in cities. Well, who's the European Commission to say that? So, you know, it's again this political game, like do a lot of promises that nobody knows. You know. This is the cynical view. You can also say it's a useful political signal and, uh, you know, some of that will transpire into national policy plans and local policy plans and it sets sort of the, the roadmap forward. So it's better than nothing. You know, you can half full or half empty. Uh, and then the carbon footprint of e-cars. E um, you can have a very mechanistic approach and compare, you know, if you have an e-car and a regular car. And then, yeah, if, in, if the e-car is on coal, you know, then it's not much better than the regular car that we're having today. But fortunately, our electricity system is a lot better than just coal. You know, it's more than 50% better, off, I think, mm -hmm. than the carbon footprint of coal. So uh, typically, an e-car is better. Uh, but yes, one of the pitfalls is stimulating second car ownership. Uh, and you know, one of the things I said in the presentation, you know, it's useful to put your money and your resources into the most efficient ways to promote sustainable mobility. And I don't think a subsidy for you know wealthy people for which an electric car is a nice second car alternative, uh, you know, is the most efficient way to use public money to to take us on the road to, to low carbon transport is much more intelligent ways. Tom, did you want to add anything to that? Or? I think it's uh, not, not much there, yeah. but I think it's difficult to make, uh, how do you say, it, forecasts. Mm -hmm. And when that could shift, I think it's even difficult to make a forecast if electric vehicles will really take off. Yeah. Uh, Still needs to be proven. In yeah. I only know that in Germany we have the one million car target for one million electric cars by 2020, and by the beginning of this year I think it was 4,000 or so. So still some some way to go. Um, well, perhaps maybe yes. include e-bikes in the target. Yeah, <laughs> to, uh, that will be the trick in the end, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Anything with wheels. Um, thanks very much. Let's draw a line here. It's five minutes past eight. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. I will just mention before closing um, that next week, Wednesday, uh, in this very building, we'll uh, explore the role of energy efficiency improvements on the road to decarbonization uh, with three speakers. You'll find them in the program. I'll not mention them now. Uh, hope to see you back then. Thanks very much to three very uh, interesting and very inspiring um, presentations and a very lively debate. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Perhaps we can give them another applause. Thanks very much.